All right, all right. So this is so we're recording. Let's give this a minute or two for people to come in. Reggie and Lisa, thank you so much for doing this with me. Absolutely. Pleasure, sir. And I'm gonna I'm gonna take a look at I always like watching who's coming in, the participants as they come in. Inevitably, I always recognize some of our friends. Hi, Hannah. Oh my gosh, and a lot of names I don't know here as well. Hey, did I, while we're killing time here, I don't think I ever told you this, Reggie, and, and Lisa, I, I, I'm sure I haven't told you. I was in a <laughs> webinar once with Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong, I didn't interview him. I was, I was an yeah. audience member. And, but I was in a webinar once with Shaquille O'Neal. And right at this point, where we're waiting for the webinar to kick off, you know what Shaquille O'Neal was doing? What? He was eating peanuts. <laughs> and like really going to town on those peanuts. Like he was, <laughs> it was, it was not a subtle, uh, I'm just going to sneak a peanut sort of thing. Like he was humping on the peanuts. <laughs> And I, hi, Mina. Nice to see you here. Yeah, we got Mina back to the community. How about that? We did? Yeah, oh, we got Mina, back. we need to talk. She's back. All right. Well, I think we got a good number of people in here, at least to get started. So, um, I, so what I'd like to do is introduce the topic of today's conversation. And I'm going to keep a very close eye on that chat because uh, I, I, <laughs> I really want Mina's coming into the chat. Okay, so I, I really would like to see you guys uh, talk to us. This is a, a purely a, a dialogue between uh, me and Lisa and Reggie. Uh, I, I'll, I'll introduce myself very briefly, then I'll, I want to introduce the topic today, and then I'd like Lisa and Reggie to introduce themselves and answer my very first question. So with that, my name is Dave Will. I know many of you already. Uh, I am the uh, co-founder and CEO of a company called Prop Fuel. It's a conversational engagement platform to help uh, associations communicate in a more human way with their members. Um, I, prior to that, I, I've, I've been working with association for 20 years or so, and that's how uh, Reggie and I originally got to know each other, and Lisa and I got to know each other more recently as she has become a client of ours. So with that, the topic today, and this was Reggie's idea actually, is what is engagement? And uh, at first I was like, eh, it's so broad, right? Like, what? But that's exactly why I like this, because engagement is this overused, diluted, watered down word. It's, uh, and tell me if you don't agree with that, by the way, jump in the chat and tell me if you disagree with anything I'm saying or anything Reggie and Lisa end up saying too. But, uh, you know, you look at AMSs and they all consider themselves member engagement systems. You'll get higher logic or any other, other community and they consider themselves engagement systems. Of course, you look at any email system, whether it's a informs real magnet sort of industry specific solution or even a broader solution, it's an engagement tool. And, you know, for sure, prop fuel, we talk about how we're going to help with conversational engagement. And so this whole idea of engaging members, if everybody's got an engagement system and if everything's engagement, is isn't just nothing really engagement at that point so not everything can be engagement otherwise it's so broad it's it's so we, we we how do we know what to do where to what to measure how do we know actions to take so what i'd like to do is start by defining what what engagement really means so that we can actually figure out what to execute on because if we can gain some clarity that's what this whole session is about. If we can gain some clarity on what engagement is, then that'll allow us to take the blurry definitions that we have that aren't at all helpful in measuring success and provide some definition around what makes this word, world, word meaningful and allow, it'll allow us to create more specific actions moving forward. So with that, I'm turning to you guys in the audience right now. Thank you, Bill, for kicking it off. 
I want everybody in the audience, everybody to give me your best definition of what engagement means. What is engagement? Now, while you're doing that, uh, Lisa, if you could introduce yourself, tell us uh, what your role is and what organization you're with. And if you don't mind, then also tell us how would you define engagement? By the way, we, we haven't, I haven't, um, they don't know what questions I'm going to be asking them. This is all <laughs> off the cuff, which kind of makes it even more fun. All right. So th this, that's a tough question, I think, to come up with on the fly. Um, so hi, everyone. So I'm Lisa Marshall. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at the Residential Real Estate Council. Uh, we are the largest affiliate of the National Association of Realtors with over 30,000 members. So I actually oversee our marketing, our sales, and our customer service department. Um, you know, I, I've really taken some time to really think about the word engagement really over the last two years, um, as we really all as an association world navigate COVID and what that looks like and how do we truly engage with our members now with so much of us going virtual or having to be remote, not having in-person events. And when I think about the definition of engagement, it really ties back to active listening, right? When we are at the association level, we think we know what our members want, but engagement is actually listening and taking that listening and applying it to real practice as to what your members want. I like the word listening. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> crucial. Who's this guy, Reggie, now? So, folks, I'm Reggie Henry, Chief Information and Engagement Officer at ASAE. And, and right on, Lisa, um, Dave and I have had some fun conversations, some half arguments about <laughs> listening and how important listening is. And, and um, I've even um, started to build listening components into all of our systems because I think it's that important. You know, I, I was thinking back to the, the last really hard conversation I, I had um, with a group of association folks about engagement. And, and you get 20 associations in the room and you get 20 different kind of responses to what it is. And then my good colleague and friend, um, David Gamble, longtime association exec, um, now works for McKinley, um, came up with this, this definition that I, that I use now. It's member engagement is the result of a member investing either their time and or their money in exchange for value. Yeah. Yeah. I'll repeat it again. It's the result of a member investing time and or money with whatever association in exchange for value. And it makes me think about two things um, or three things. First thing it makes me think about is that they expect something in return for that. They expect some value and that value might be at an education program, that value might be some mentoring, that value might be something, but there's an expectation of value for that. Um, then the other thing is, I think we as associations undervalue um, the time that our volunteers and other members use in engaging with the organization. And so that, that definition keeps that top of mind for me as well. Well, my friend at uh, American Psychiatric Association, Latoya, put in the chat, and, and Reggie, I think your definition is very, very close to this one, or hers is close to yours, which is engagement is a valuable exchange between members in the organization. I mean, that's essentially a, a shorter version of David Gamble's definition. Absolutely. I, I, I love what Bill Taylor said here, too, understanding the needs of your members. Uh, that's a phrase you use often, Reggie, uh, of your members and acting upon those needs and wants as they pertain to the objectives of the or association. Um, yeah. You know, and if you think about it, that's our job, right? That's our job. Our job is to be there for our members at their time of need. <laughs> that, 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 that's what they pay for, pay us for, is being there in those times of need. And, and so I'm so glad Lisa started this off with this, this, this focus on knowing what your members need from you and not guessing what your members need from you and not using you know, your survey from three years ago. Um, and, and here's my, um, and folks, this is not a marketing thing for Prop Fuel, but I will just say this is that that's what we use that for. 
is having a conversation with our members on an ongoing basis where we're not trying to sell them something. I'm not trying to get them to come to an event. I'm trying to engage them about around what their struggles are right now in, in the right now so that we can be responsive to those things. I, I, thanks, Reggie. I, I like Mina's comment about stickiness too. Mm -hmm. I think stickiness is a great, uh, uh, is that onomatopoeia when you have a word that sounds like what it what it means um the use of onomatopoeia or something like that and that's my that's the only word i know from from english but and i don't even know that that's what this is but stickiness is a good word to describe i think this thing we're talking about called engagement uh it's still rather fuzzy for me though uh so let's let's break it down a little bit more speaking of engagement so disappointing like there's way more people in this webinar than I got definitions here. That's <laughs> so there's not a high here. Here's a here's the definition of engagement. And it's actually here's what engagement is not. It's what's happening in this chat right now. So <laughs> so the, um, let's let's talk about this. What, what is what do you think is the ultimate goal of engagement? What, and, and maybe I'm just asking the same question in a slightly different way, which is okay. But like, what what, is, what are we trying to do by getting people engaged? Is is it a money thing? Are we just trying to get the renewal? And there's nothing wrong with that. That Mina even said that in her definition. It's like we're we're doing things to relevant to people's needs and stickiness to get their money. Yeah. Um... So let me let me answer that in two ways, because um, I think everyone always assumes that marketing is sales and sales is marketing um, in the association world and in any organization, every job, there is a component of sales in it. That's just it. And I think what's important is that when you look at what the goal of engagement is, the goal is to truly have a real conversation with your members where they understand the value that you provide to them. So that way, when they do pay their dues, their, you know, they go on the trips, they are not focusing on the cost, but on the value. And that value is reinforced through the engagement that you have with them. So I think it's all one conversation. Because if you do engagement right, you're going to have sales, you're going to have conversions, you're going to have the retention you need. But if you're not engaging, they don't have value. So there's no proposition for them to stay. That's right. You know, and, and if I look at, um, and, I, and I do this routinely, I, I look at the people who spend the most time with our organization and the people who spend the most money with our organization. And you know what? Those lists look eerily similar most of the time. They look eerily similar because of what Lisa just laid out there. If you are listening to what your members are telling them they need and you're providing them with that kind of value, um, then, then they come back. You know, imagine if we had enough of a conversation with our members on an ongoing basis, that renewal time isn't renewal time, it's how can I help you next year achieve the goals that you have for next year? That's my goal with engagement. My goal with, with engaging, especially um, our organization members, is to have enough of a relationship with them, this give and take. Uh, the give is what you need and what they take back is, is the things that we do to, to help them with their needs. That at the end of the year, wouldn't it be great to have a recap conversation that said, you needed these things from ASAE and we provided you with these things. What did we miss? How can we help you next year? Who else needs to be engaged in your organization? So I think this exchange of value, and I think people understand that, they, that, that the money that most associations make goes back into creating products and services that are hopefully providing value. So this idea that money's a bad word in here, is, is, it's not a bad word. It's what it takes to make the engine run, quite honestly. The other thing that it takes is value. Yeah, the it, I think Lisa, you nailed it, and Reggie just you just um, uh, confirmed uh, this thing about uh, money not being an evil word. And uh, Lisa used the word value. That word keeps coming up here. Sometimes uh, I just had a conversation with an association exec, um, a, f a friend, and she uh, has always worked for associations, never worked for a corporation. 
Um, I, I, in turn, have never worked for an association. I work with associations. I always consider myself an association professional, but I'm not an association exec in the way that I've never worked for an association. I'm an entrepreneur and entrepreneurs build business. Business generally is for profit, right? So that makes us greedy or wanting money, right? The driver is money. And that was this person's perspective and it's completely wrong. The, the, dry, the, the output is profit. The output is money. The, uh, it's a measurement of success. It's a measurement of creating value. So without value, there is no money. With, great, with a lot of value comes a higher measurement of, of money. So the same is true for associations. It's not at all different. If there's value, money will follow because money is a metric of how much value you're creating. So uh, that, that's my take on, on that whole conversation about is money a bad thing? Should we be chasing money or not? Reggie, you also mentioned- the, so the trick for the association though, is that the reverse has to be true from the member's point of view that where there's money being spent, that value has to follow. Sure, <laughs> or else the money will stop being spent. That's exactly right. Uh, Bill Taylor says it's a two-way street, grow the member and, and in turn grow your association. That's exactly what you were saying. It's a give and take, it's a two-way street. Um, Shannon said retention. Uh, of course, it's retention essentially is another way of saying, uh, I mean, retention is proving value. Somebody said in here, I'm going to try to find their comment. Uh, but it was a comment about longer term. Uh, here it is. Uh, so so uh, Ray says engagement is interactions that stimulate the flow of, of neurotransmitter of, of <laughs> a neurotransmitter of neurotransmitters within an audience that causes an action or a lasting impression i'm not sure what a neurotransmitter is but i do know what a lasting impression is right. and that the word lasting is really interesting because that gets into more of a tr less of a transactional exchange right. and more of this sentiment of loyalty and so talk to me lisa uh, let's start with you what what is your take on uh engagement is engagement better defined as a transactional experience and i hope i'm not feeding this to you too much because it could be is is engagement a transactional experience or is engagement really uh, does it fall more in line with this sentiment of belongingness yeah um and there's there's a really good question too in the chat that goes along with this um and i think the person says does listening create member expectations we don't want or cannot meet um and i think it goes back to what is engagement? Is it transactional or not? Um, the key to listening to your members is not the fact that you're going to deliver on everything. The key to listening to your members is that now you have a starting place on where you need to meet them. And I'm a firm believer that you have to get to the future and meet your client there. And that's what associations have to do right now is that we have to meet our members where they're going to be before they get there and anticipate that. And that starts with listening. And of course, you're not gonna meet every expectation. That's why I think in certain cases, I'm gonna to have to lean to engagement is transactional, right? There is a give and a take on both ends and we're going to see results. And sometimes you're not gonna see anything. And that means you gotta go back and you gotta recalibrate. But I think that the art of it is truly understanding that you have to get to where your members are going to be before they are going to be there. Hey, Reggie, I want to hear your thoughts, but let me be the bridge from Lisa to you to comment on this a little bit. I belong to an association called Entrepreneurs Organization. Uh, it's 14,000 members around the world. Um, I, in, the reason I belong is because I'm an entrepreneur and it's my identity. That's, that's just who I am. And I can't imagine being an entrepreneur and not belonging to an organization that connects me with other uh, like-minded individuals. It's a place where I can engage and interact. So they have seminars, they have sessions, they have conferences, they have uh, meetups, they have uh, adventures, and I can pay to go on all those and that's revenue. But 
that's not, I mean, I do some of those and some of them I don't, but that's not why I belong. I belong because it's who I am. And it's, it's a complete, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, these are my people. It's my tribe. Right. So it, I think I agree with you, Lisa, that transactions drive engagement or engagement or transactions. But how does that, Reggie, translate to my sentiment of why I belong and why I renew with, a, with EO every year? Well, let me back up before I answer that part of the question to this, this transaction versus non-transactional stuff. You guys might remember that a while ago we did some research and, and a book was written called The Decision to Join. And it was the, the subtitle of that was how individuals determine value and why they choose to belong. That was the subtitle of the book. So in that, in that book and in that research, we separated out transactional engagement from non-transactional and the transactional definition, the definition of transaction we was using was financial, okay? And so we looked at things like people who made a presentation or wrote a white paper or helped recruit members or served on a committee committee or other types of volunteering. And what the study showed at that time was that on average across all associations, 67% of an associate's, association's members don't do the non-transactional engagement thing. And, and I say that for two reasons. I, I think one, we, we have these lofty goals sometimes of, of what we should expect as if every member is going to do everything we ask them to do. And it's just not the case. You know, that, that's, that, that 67% of folks don't do those things uh, or our mailboxes, we used to call them, is a thing. Um, so I just, just wanted people to be aware of that. The, the other thing that I'll say, Dave, is that we did a customer behavior study um, actually, we did it during COVID, um, and we asked, the, the goal of that was to ask our members, what are those major things you want from ASAE? What are those major things you want from the organizations? Two things stood out to me that I wouldn't have gotten if we were doing any other kind of analysis. One was the highest rated thing was members expect us to engender a sense of belonging. Um, out of all the things we do, that was the thing that was the most important to them in generating this sense of belonging. And what we realized in, in having conversations with them, that that didn't always involve something that ASA wanted to sell them or wanted them to do. It really meant connecting them with their colleagues in ways we might not have thought about. So, you know, I, I have to fight with us sometime because some of the engagement our members want to do within our organization doesn't involve us. And we got to be cool with that. You know, I, I, it, we've got to be cool with the fact that the, the sense of belonging is belonging to the whole and that we might be a part of the whole. And sometimes we might be a small part of the whole. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, it's no, it's no, it's not lost on me what you said about this belonging thing, because most members live for that as part of their engagement within organizations. Uh, Mina says, "Question, but, but that, that's what was on my mind about it." <laughs> Mina says, "Not everyone may want a long-term relationship, and and it, it, which raises an interesting question for me. There's different." I know not everybody has the same wants and needs as me in EO, Entrepreneurs Organization. Not everybody is a part of EO because they want their peers, they, they want to be connected with their peers, right? And and that's something that I know, I, I can tell you that that's one of the foundations behind Propula, at least, is when you talk to people, everybody has their own unique needs at any given particular time in their journey, right? Uh, so to, I completely agree with you, Mina, not everyone wants a long-term relationship. In fact, everybody wants something a little bit different. So how do we uh, measure engagement or encourage engagement when there's so many different people with different needs out there. So, so Dave, and I'll ask Lisa to respond to this as well. Money's not a bad word and customer's not a bad word either. Nope. So if you've got people who just wanna buy your stuff 
And that's all they want to do. They want to come to the annual meeting once a year because they want to buy some education from you. Or they're doing benchmarking in the organization. They want to buy your benchmarking report. And that's their definition of how they get value. There's nothing wrong with having customers. <laughs> there's, there's nothing wrong with that. They provide some of the money to do some of the other things you need to do in the organization. So I think, you know, when we, we, we talk about this engagement, the number of arguments I get in with people around, if you take the finance, the stuff that people buy from you off the table, how else are you engaging your members? Um, you know, having that discussion. But I, the point I wanted to make is there's nothing wrong with having a, a transactional relationship with somebody who wants to buy stuff from you. But how do you identify, um, how do you, and I'm trying to ask this in a way that doesn't necessarily lob up a, like a, a response to say, well, you use prop fuel because, but this is always on my mind, which is how do you identify that everybody is unique? Everybody has different needs. So how do you engage a membership of, how many members did you say you have, Lisa? Is it 20, 30,000? 30, 30, yeah. So how do you engage 30,000 people? I guess you could put them into segments. But even there, like you look within any given segment and you still have five, six, seven thousand individuals that don't all think exactly the same. So how as a marketer, how do you uh, engage 30,000 people, Lisa? Yeah, so so let me give you a really good example. Um, and I'm going to use McDonald's, right? McDonald's serves millions of people every single day. But if you look at their menu, they really have three items that they're selling. If that, right? They got a burger, they got nuggets, they got fries. That's about it. In the association world, we have to really look at ourselves like McDonald's. We're only going to have just so much. And it takes us to then take those three things that we do really well and be able to create verticals for people that are in different stages in their career that we serve you, right? And that is what we have to do. That's the art of having 30,000 people say, I'm going to pay to be a part of this, is that we don't need to go and stretch ourselves in all these different channels, right? We don't need to go and, hey, today we're now providing our members insurance and tomorrow we're doing, no, no, no. Let's stick to what we do and let's do it well. McDonald's has a very limited menu, right? Uh, a McDouble is the same as a double, it, it's the same thing. A burger is a burger, but it still serves a purpose to whoever came through the drive-through today and wanted nuggets versus someone who came through the drive-through and wanted you know, a fish fillet, whatever it may be, but stop trying to overextend yourself and give your members benefits that they don't want. Operate in the space in which you dominate. At the Residential Real Estate Council, we dominate in education. We dominate with our designation. And that is the space in which we talk about. Because I really like that. Yeah, we, we don't stretch ourselves in all these different areas. We take what we do best and we make sure it applies correctly to anyone at any stage in their career. Beautiful. You can't be all things to all people, right? Well, Lisa, you forgot one thing now. McDonald's has milkshakes. And in particular, okay. Okay. they have strawberry <laughs> milkshakes, okay? <laughs> and that, and Sometimes that's you get a point. few. Sometimes you, yeah. When the machine's working. When the machine is working. <laughs> right. When the machine is working. You know, the thing I, I thought about as you were talking is, uh, and I have to remind myself of this a lot of time is that sometimes we get into this mode of we have to do everything for our members and and we don't it's not our job to do everything it might be our job to see to it that everything gets done in some kind of fashion but that doesn't mean we have to be the one to do it so i've seen you know there, there'll be times for example when a, a segment of our members it might be a smaller segment of our members are in need of something that we just don't do. And what I do often is find another organization that does it and steer them to that other organization that does that thing, or find one of our industry partners who might do it and invite them to come in and help me solve that problem. But, but your idea of sticking to your knitting, you know, know what it is that you're really, really good at and build engagement around those things and accept the fact that if 
if you got a segment of your members who are not getting value there, that just might need to be the case if the majority of the members need this core set of things you do. Tamika uh, has put her, her first tweet in here in the chat, which is a hashtag powerful operate in the space you dominate. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. And um, uh, Mina has a good point also about um, how oftentimes, and it's, it's, it's not just um, in your organizations, Mina, I think everybody does this we think of some cool idea and we're like oh they're gonna love it and we develop this idea in-house when oftentimes we should be listening more and then reacting and responding now you know who would probably disagree with that is steve jobs so help me let's talk about mina's comment here so i've heard a lot of people say they don't customers don't always know what it is they want but the common theme here is we need to listen to our customers to figure out what to deliver. So where is that fine line between creating stuff that we know because we're experts in this piece of the world. Uh, so we, we're creating innovation. I mean, innovation doesn't always come from your customer. Sometimes innovation comes from a super creative mind that is listening to the customer and applying uh, creative thought to their needs. Talk to me about that intersection. I, 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 so so two, two things I'll say about that. One is, um, I don't think I'm in the business of providing what our customers want. I think I'm in the business of providing them what they need. And, and I think that's different. I, I really mm. do think that's different. I like that, yeah. And, and you know, there are plenty of ways, and, and you know I've got some screens to show if people want to see them that show how we garner what's on our on our members' minds and how we're going to figure out what they need from us. You know, people, people won't, that, that what I want is such a, a cyclical and episodic thing that I'm never going to be able to, to meet, that, meet that level of, 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 of compliance with our members. But when there's demonstrated need um, around so, uh, things that associations need, I know I've got what, I, what it takes to do that. So. I separate those things out all the time. Might be nuanced, but I think it's important. You know, um, my, my department is incredibly creative and uh, what we do is education. So we're always producing new content weekly, literally. Uh, and, and what I always find really interesting is that in the association space, if we were a traditional startup, having idea after idea after idea would be welcomed. But then in the association space, we have an idea, it goes out and we're like, it didn't, it didn't succeed. Next. But what we are so quick to do is to write off a great idea and not nurture it. Because in the association space, it takes time for your members to adopt a new idea or product or education. So when you go out to market, you can't just say, okay, no one bought this today. No one bought it today. Let's put a plan to nurture this, right? Because on average, when you roll out something new to your members, it takes a minimum of six months. And that's for the highly engaged members to really catch on to it because they're also getting so many messages. I mean, on a day-to-day, -day, we get 3,000 commercial messages. So if you sent out something new, they wouldn't even know it was new. <laughs> they would say, oh, when did this become new? Right. So we have to put time into nurturing ideas. And I am a big believer that you can plant a seed today but allow it to water. Every great idea doesn't have to go out today. There's, there's something about timing. Um, and, I, and I can't speak to that enough because we are so quick to say, let me be the first or let me respond to what they're doing. Again, you have to make sure you operate in the space in which you dominate. It may not be that moment, but I promise you six months from now, it will be the right time and your members will need it in response to what they're going through. Absolutely. You know, the other thing I'll say, Dave, is, is we try to surprise our members. I remember there was there was um, a slogan one of a, a person I worked for said that we, we want to surprise and delight our members. And the delight I get, but the surprise thing, I don't know that that worked well all the time. Um, and what I have found that worked well was if if you have the right relationship with your member members and you really 
have systems in place to listen to what they need. And then you tell them that you're working on that and you invite them in to help create the solution. I, you know, I call it working out loud. When I do that, invariably projects do what they need to do. Because as you're building whatever it is you want people to be engaged around, you're engaging them in that process of helping solve their, their problems or, or fulfilling their needs. And at the end of it, they're your first customers and clients. You know, a, a good, a good um, thing that, that brings that to mind for me is how Collaborate started. You know, when, when Collaborate first started, we, we, there wasn't Collaborate, but there was this other thing called, well, I forget the name of it because it was such a painful experience. It was called Member to Member. That's what it was called. And it was, and to build that, we had this task force of 95 association execs helping me think through what needed to be in there. Well, member to member sucks so bad that I know I had to get rid of it. But then we got Collaborate. And you know who the first customers were? Those 95 people. And you know who helped me sell that to the rest of the community? Those 95 people. So I, I think there's, you know, this, this idea that, that we, have to, we have to innovate behind closed doors and then bring it there. Um, no, involve your members in all of this. Involve your members in their responsibility in the part of engagement as well. It's a two-way street. You know, we, we've, um, I, 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 I want to keep prop fuel out as, as much as I can because this is really a conversation about engagement, but there's certain things that, that trigger a thought. And, and there's this thing called the inbox where uh, you can not only blast out questions to groups of people to drill down into individual needs, but then after somebody answers and maybe comments on something, you can connect directly with that person. So it turns into this long tail of one-to-one -one interaction. And I think that it, what I find really interesting is because there's no easy way for professionals in our space to actually connect with individuals other than email or picking up the phone, randomly or by happenstance, it doesn't happen. And so we've been trained to only talk to groups of people, not to talk to individuals. I mean, Lisa, you got 30,000 members. How do you talk to 30,000 individuals? You Oh, oh, they call our customer service department. No, uh. <laughs> All right. Next, next topic is about uh, um, engagement scoring. I've, I've bounced back and forth between engagement scoring. I'm very curious to hear your thoughts, Lisa. Do, do you think there's value in putting a number next to a member's name to tell us whether or not they're engaged? I know I asked that in a really negative way, but yeah, I'm open-minded yeah, to this. Well, Reggie, you'll have your chance, all right? So, <laughs> so Lisa, okay, is there is there a way to identify who are the best engaged or who are the less, less engaged in our association by tagging people with numbers um okay I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna answer this in two ways um the biggest part of me wants to say no because engagement is a snapshot in time so at that time that mm. person may have been truly engaged and they may be a 10 and a week from now you take another snapshot they could be a three so I think when you put a number next to a member's engagement, what you're saying is at this moment, right now, you are engaged. But that doesn't mean tomorrow at five o'clock you're engaged. That doesn't mean next week. That doesn't mean next month. And what we do is that when we assign a number, we then stop thinking we have to keep engaging. Oh, okay, I re I, you got to attend an engagement. All right, I did my part. I'm done, I'm, I'm done serving you as my member, no. So when you no longer put a number next to your member, you now are requiring yourself to constantly stay engaged with them, to constantly stay on the pulse of where they are, what they're doing, and what they need from you as an association. Okay, Reggie, it's your turn. But in, before you, you say anything, uh, folks, if you have any questions for Reggie and Lisa, please put it in the chat. I, I have more questions, but I want this to be about you guys too. So if there's things you want to know about or, or ask these guys about engagement, please put it in there. Go ahead, Reggie. Engagement yeah. scoring. Well, well said, uh, Lisa, first of all. But, but secondly, 
you know, it, 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 at some point it gets down to what you believe in and from a, a member point of view and whether or not you believe that individual members deserve individual attention, some philosophical stuff. But I will say it, and somebody said it in the chat just now, that most organizations that I've seen using engagement score use it as a, a, a measure of what people are buying from them. That's what they use that engagement score for. And if that's what you want it to do, then fine. I wouldn't call it an engagement. I would call it a customer score or something different than that that's based on the fact that it's a financial thing. My own personal opinion about this, Dave, and I think you asked this question just to irk me sometimes because you know how I feel about engagement scores, is we've kind of, at some point in time, we have to learn how to scale um, things down to the market of one. I need to know what Lisa needs from me. I need to know what you need to me. And this it's really not a technology problem. We've got all the technologies we need to be able to do something like that. It's a mindset problem. It really is a mindset problem. And you know, when you were talking earlier and you asked Lisa a question about segments, I sort of shake a little bit when you asked it that about segments, because it's you know, at, at some point, even if you look at a segment of all the marketing people, for example. Their needs are not homogenous across that whole group. They, they never were and they never will be. And so I think if we get a different mindset uh, about, about, about how we serve members and, and, and a little bit of an aside, I asked our organization once, what's our sell versus serve ratio? And we went into a freaking tailspin trying to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> But we should know what that is, right? We should know what the what 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 a portion of our resources are there for selling things to our members, and what portion of our resources are there for serving our members. We should know what that is, and most organizations haven't even thought about that yet. But I, this idea of being able to scale down to a point where you have the right things in place to ask every member what they need, and the right things in place to point them to the resources you have that fulfill those needs. That's a very real thing we have to get used to being able to do. I, I, so I, I hear, I just want to comment on this for a second. I, I really like that observation that engagement scoring is uh, a, a snapshot in time, Lisa. However, if you capture multiple snapshots it forms a, a motion picture doesn't it like isn't that how a motion picture is <laughs> is created is a collection of snapshots and 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 mina commented well we're, we're measuring transactions but can't we ask a question literally the question how connected do you feel to the association how well do we I, I, I play a role in your identity as a person you, you can ask these questions which that's, help that's fill not those. an engagement score, though. That's a very, I mean, that's a different thing. What is that? Really is. that well, the way you ask it, it's a leading question. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, 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 but what if you ask that question instead of this? How much do you like me? I love you. you know that. How handsome am I? Very On a scale person. of eight to 10. Three at least, OK? But, <laughs> But but suppose you ask those questions as opposed to worrying about some freaking engagement score. How well connected do you feel to this organization and what could we do to make you feel more connected? Well said. I love it. Yeah, that, I, I love that you said that. Ask those questions instead of trying to come up with an engagement score. Cool. All right. I, I want to talk. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm sorry. I want to talk about trade associations for a second and engagement because trade associations make up a huge part of uh, our community. And when you're, and I know Reggie at ASAE, you have organizational members as well as professional members. And so you might be able to answer this really, really well. Uh, Lisa, I'm not sure. Do you have organizational members at residential real estate? Okay, so but I know you've been in the industry for a long time, so I'm sure you'll have some input here as well. With organizational members, when we try to engage an organization, how is that different than trying to engage 
an individual or a professional. And then you have another element of this. Organizations oftentimes buy memberships for their team, for their employees. Uh, Propfuel is a good example. We make every single one of our employees a member of ASAE. Reggie, you and I were just talking about this recently. So we are an organizational member, essentially, and we're making our employees members of ASAE. How do you engage PropFuel differently than you would engage Lisa, one of the members of our team? I don't. Organizations don't buy things. People at organizations buy things. Organizations don't use things. People at organizations use things. So, you know, we have this organization membership. And I remember the battles we were going on about what to call the thing. And I finally told them, look, stop making this hard. This is an organizational buy of individual memberships. We're, we're engaging with individuals. We're not engaging with the organization. Somebody said, well, suppose the organization wants to buy a benchmarking study because they're trying to set salaries for the organization. Well, then most likely it's the HR person at that organization buying that particular thing. So I think, you know, you can, you can spend a whole lot of time trying to think about how you sell something to an organization. But it, it, to me, it's a moot conversation because the organization doesn't buy stock. Lisa, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I'll be honest with you. I, don't, I think it really is the individual. Um, we are always serving the I within someone right? We are always serving the individual, regardless if it's an organization, they purchased it to maybe engage the individuals that are in their organization, whoever it is, it always goes back to I. And what we are doing is to define what does that I do for that individual? Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, I was just typing something to you. Could you expand on your last comment? Uh, I've been in associations where that isn't true. What, what isn't true, Bill? I uh, so let me, I'm going to drill down into this uh, uh, organizational member thing a little bit more. When a professional joins an association, they're joining because they see something that is intriguing to them. When an organization joins, they make all of their employees or all their constituents in their organization a member. And so oftentimes with organizational memberships or trade associations, the individuals don't even know they're a member of this association. Do you engage them differently than you would engage somebody that joins voluntarily? So we have- Or is that more tactical, really, what I'm it's, talking it's about? It's tactical, but it's a very important thing you're asking. You know, we started to, to have um, monthly kind of um, um, in, uh, integration and initiation sessions for all of our new organization members, okay? And the first thing, the first time we did that, this onboarding thing, one of the individuals at the organization says, wait a minute, I used to be a member of ASAE. I didn't get this onboarding when I was an individual member. So it, it just made me go, duh, people need the same thing. So, you know, I really don't, yeah. I really do look when, at it when an organization um, decides to have an organization membership, it really, for me, is an organization by of individual memberships. And everybody at that organization needs to be onboarded. Do we track whether or not they onboard? Yeah. And if they, if they don't come to one of the onboarding sessions, do we reach out to them again? Yeah. Um, but it's, it's individual focused. All right, I have two more questions uh, and then we'll wrap. Uh, one is uh, taking this this discussion about con about engagement, um, defining it and breaking it down and chopping it up into pieces. What can we do better? What can associations do better to engage their members? Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, do we have enough time? Okay. Right. Um, Plenty of time. <laughs> what can associations do better to engage their members? Um, Super broad question, I know, but it really it's the crux of what we're doing here today is we're defining engagement so that we can figure out how to actually measure it and do it better. Okay. Um, I'm going to tell you what, what, what my tips and tricks are. Um, one, I think we have to get out of the ideas of 
traditional conversation methods. Um, I think associations need to leverage their social media channels um, and be really engaged out there in the social sphere to ensure that they know what their members are into. What are your, who are your members following? Who are their influencers? Understanding that space. Um, and then that allows for you to really be able to engage with them in a different level. Um, I think something that's also important is really creating more efficiencies in the way in which you communicate um, and constantly surveying your members, non-members, lapsed members. I know everyone's like, oh, I do my annual, sur no, no, no. Like you need to be doing like monthly to bi-monthly surveys to know where your members are. If you're gonna keep them engaged, you need to be surveying them. And this is not a shameful plug for Profuel because they don't pay me for this, but it is something to be truly said about really sending a one check-in step survey to your members and knowing immediately, is this what they want? Is this not what they want? Um, one of the surveys that I always speak to really highly with Profuel is our lapsed member campaign. And it was literally just one question, which was, did you even know your membership had lapsed? And it was amazing to see how many people didn't even know that in the course of their day-to-day -day going on with their lives, they're like, I, I didn't even know I missed an invoice. Yep. I skipped that altogether. So just to see that is why you have to keep a pulse to your members. Why, hey, if you lapsed and we need to be right there finding out what did we do? How do we do it better? And my last trip, I have to be honest with you, um, look at your member benefits. Are you actually giving a benefit? And do they really understand their benefits? Something we just recently implemented was our Membership Matters newsletter. And it goes out every month. And it is truly just a newsletter of your benefits. We're not selling you anything. We're not remind. We are literally saying, here is what you have as a member. We're not gonna wait until it's dues time and oh, now you need to know your benefits because we, we need to collect the money. It's like, no, here is every single month, a newsletter dedicated to you utilizing your benefits. Um, and then we've continued to really innovate the way in which we engage with our members and they can contact us. Um, and I think that's really vital. Thank you. In fact, actually, I've never done this before. My partner's probably gonna kill me when I say this, but anyone listening to this today, and I definitely just the people in this live webinar, if you're watching the recording, you're out, sorry, just the people in live webinar, uh, I want to try this. Uh, if you're interested in trying that question to your audience, by the way, I hate the word survey. Survey is a dissection of your membership. It is not a way to get to the individual needs. Propuel's conversational engagement. So I'm going to forgive me for, for attacking that word, but I, it makes me cringe, much like segment <laughs> makes you cringe, Reggie. Uh, but, but when we spark a conversation with a question like that, it opens the door for conversation, opens the door for a string of reactions to how they're interacting with you. So if, if you're interested in asking that question to a set of lapsed members or all your lapsed members at any given point in time, um, uh, I'm happy to help you build that and we'll try it out and just see how it works for you. It's pretty awesome. It's really, really yeah. cool to see how people interact, not just with the question. And I know ASAE does this too, not just with the question, um, uh, did you know your membership lapsed? Which Reggie, unfortunately, ASAE is, is, is embarrassingly high that <laughs> said, no, they didn't know. Yeah. But the, the other question is, are you planning to renew? And that's actually a separate question another time. Are you planning to renew your membership? Shocking number of people say yes, yep. but many of them actually don't right away. And so now that's another great question to play with. So anyway, I'm offering that to anybody here. Send me an email, dave at propfuel.com if you want me to help you set that up. And it takes us about two seconds to set up an account so I can set that up for you and, and we'll play around with that single question. Reggie, what is, uh, what is, how do we do it better? How do we engage better? So, so, so two things. One, I, and again, this is a mindset. And, and I remember having this conversation back when, we, when mobile first started to hit and we were wondering what does digital and mobile have to do with all of this? And, and I, I remember saying this out loud during one of the presentations and I realized what I had just said is that, that we're so used to, our members operating in, in our world. 
That's how we've always been. You have to come into the ASAE world to operate. And with digital, it, I've seen it happen across a whole bunch of different sectors. People have their own digital worlds now that they live in and their own way of interact, digital ways of interacting. And we have to figure out how to fit into their worlds. We really do. And, and, and so there's a couple of things. One is I think people are wasting valuable information by not having listening posts in all of their systems. If you look at all, if you, for example, if you look at all the time, say you have something like Collaborate and you have something like, um, like a website and you've got those places. Every day people are coming there searching for something that they need, every day. And sometimes the trend, it ends up in a transaction, sometimes it doesn't, but it still is an indicator of need. So what do you have across all of your systems, especially ones where people can search for things um, that, that tell you what your organization needs. And I'll tell you that looking at that data and, and being able to see when needs are spiking and declining um, in terms of being responsive in people's times of need um, has been remarkable for us. Um, for example, we were able to see and collaborate way back when, when, when something called coronavirus was becoming a big topic. And we could see that that spike was steeper than anything we've ever seen. And we were able to respond by having CEO town halls on the topic and developing resources around the topic. And you know what? Our members gobbled that stuff up. So there are plenty of ways um, with existing systems that you have to install little listening things that will give you a very good indicator of what your members' needs are. And then you can use something like PropFuel to, to say, we noticed in the membership section that these were some questions that were troubling people. Are you troubled by any of these things? I mean, you can have that kind of a conversation based on no need um, and really start to generate engagement with your folks. Well, I really appreciate um, Lisa, you and Reggie joining me. Can you tell me uh, if, if anyone here wants to reach out to you, Lisa, what's the best way for them to reach you? Yeah, if anyone wants to reach out to me, my email address is lmarshall with two L's at CRS.com. And Reggie? It's Reggie at ASAECenter.org. And I am Dave at PropFuel.com. Again, Lisa, Reggie, I, I love working with you guys. Thanks so much for being a part of this. Reggie, great suggestion on the topic. The, the chat is so much more fun than a PowerPoint presentation. So thank you for joining me for this. And Lisa, strawberry milkshakes at McDonald's are a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Love you guys. See ya. Yeah.